and uh, introduce our wonderful speaker for this evening, William Rowlandson. So, um, William works at the University of Kent as a senior lecturer in Hispanic studies. He is the author of many books um, and articles on Latin American cultural and political history, uh, Cuban literature, Borges, Swedenborg, mysticism, psychedelics, the imaginal, fairy and the demonic. He describes himself as a gardener, a composter, a vermophile, a mycophile, drummer, proud tree hugger, megalithomaniac and a weird and Love it. <laughs> so without further ado, I will, um, we're just delighted to have William here. Um, and uh, William did actually say uh, that if you wanted to just go and maybe lie down somewhere, make yourself really comfy. Um, you don't have to sort of stare at a screen um, if you don't want to and just let William's words wash over you. Um, and maybe have a think as well about the Q&A at the end. We'll, we'll sort of grill William uh, towards the end. So if you have any um, Q&As for the chat, then please do pop them in as we're going through. But William, it's a pleasure. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Louise. And as always, thank you so much for joining us, uh, for joining me, for, for, for being here today. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be sharing any, um, any images or anything. So you've just got my hairy face for a while. So, so if you want to zone out, then, then I advise you to do so. So first of all, happy equinox, everyone. Um, it's, uh, I just returned um, not half an hour ago, no, a bit longer than that, maybe an hour ago, I returned from the allotment, which is just down the road, where I have a plot. I returned with my daughter, and we looked at the tadpoles wiggling in the, in the, in the, in the spawn, the tiny little dots of, of tadpoles in the spawn. Um, we saw the rhubarb leaves that just uh, a week ago were these tiny, tiny fists, these green fists have now all unfurled and are waving in the autumn, in the, in the afternoon sunlight. It's beautiful. Um, and the wheel turns and it's lovely to see. And I was reminded of a poem by Philip Larkin um, called The Trees. And just uh, a couple of couplets from there just came to my mind earlier. The trees are coming into leaf like something almost being said. And then the poem ends. Last year is dead, they seem to say. Begin afresh, afresh, afresh. Ah, oh, I love that. Now, I'm also going to pause before I begin and have a dedication. I dedicate this talk to the Huntingham Oak and the Covington Pear, and all the lush tangle of woodland, copse, hedgerow, thicket, stream, pond, bog, and meadow, and all the bountiful life that once bustled in those areas, sacrificed to HS2. Tree protectors, some of whom are friends of mine from the road protest sites of the early 1990s, have bravely encamped and tunnelled to halt the destruction. I cannot bear to follow the story. Images of bulldozers and huge tracked vehicles and stumps and exposed roots and deep muddy tracks and metal fences and men in high-vis jackets and hard hats appall me and frighten me. I can do nothing physical to stop the destruction and so have concentrated on my strengths on resisting acts of destruction in my own area. So farewell Huntingham Oak and farewell Covington Pear and strength to tree and water and land and air protectors everywhere. That's my dedication. I don't usually dedicate talks, but I have today. I feel quite powerfully about that. So this journey into the wild began many years ago. And when I look back to when I first became beguiled by the wild, I can find no resting pace, no start to the journey. I sense coursing through the veins of our body politic, great fear of the wild, great disrespect for the will of the wild, denial of the will of the wild. I have always held an animist relationship with the world. And when I discovered panpsychism, I added that to my reality filter. Self-will of the wild, self-willed, animated, alive, conscious. I think of epistemologies as fields of cereal, ways of understanding the world that are increasingly homogenized by monoculture, by synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and fungicides. And I sense the fear of the wild motivating brutal treatment of the wild. As such, 
I am abuzz with the conversations about wilding and rewilding. And I am abuzz at witnessing the conversations about wilding and rewilding, challenging ways of thinking that treat the wild with such fear and disregard. Like city trees providing urban habitats for all manner of beasties, so the conversations about wilding and rewilding provide space and protection for systems of thought, epistemologies, that have been long regarded, sorry, that have long disregarded the wild margins of the land and the wild margins of the psyche, which if you think about it, are the same thing. So exploration of wilding, which is what we're doing tonight, is a process of wilding. Research, you see, is always self-research. Some years ago, I really understood that when I was researching mysticism, and I understood that the research into mysticism was itself a mystical search. As research into magic is a magical quest. Research into revolution is a revolutionary act. In asking what the wild means, I am self-researching. And in the same way that I ask how to research sustainability sustainably, how to teach post-colonialism post-colonially in a colonial world, it's a question of what Sartre would call praxis, a question of behavior inspired by ideas, ideas and thought processes, and it is thus epistemological. So, wilding the hedgerows is wilding the mind. But what does wilding mean? What is rewilding? Like the question, what is culture? or what is nature, or the particularly beguiling, what is sustainability? The exploration of the term takes you to some complex, confusing and richly bioabundant systems. Now, my contributions to the discourse of wilding and rewilding grow from the rich soils of humanities, languages, text, art, poetics, culture. Wilding humanities, wilding epistemologies, wilding ontologies, wilding pedagogies, wilding the imagination, wilding the mind, wilding the psyche, wilding ourselves and our ways of thinking. Okay, but what is wilding? So wilding has its roots in the rich soils of conservation, ecology, land stewardship, rebellion and resistance. But curiously enough, in order to ask the question, what is wilding? We have to ask first, what is rewilding? Turns and returns, which comes first? Now, rewilding's roots reach back into the rich soils of US environmentalism. With environmentalist activist and co-founder of the Earth First movement, Dave Foreman in the early 1990s. And there is an emphasis in returning apex predators to ecosystems, restoring complex dynamics, recapturing what has been lost. So you have to imagine for rewilding vast space, American notions of wilderness, humans decentered, natural systems flourishing unhindered, rich soils indeed. But also rewilding is restoration, harking back to before the industrial revolution, to before the agricultural revolution to before colonization. Early Holocene and back to the late Pleistocene, restoring top carnivores and other keystone species, restoration of functional and resilient ecosystems. And surely at the wildest reaches of the vision of rewilding, you cut out the human altogether. But it's richer and more complex than a simple turning back of the clock to some arbitrary baseline in the past or to cutting out the human. There are no baselines. Everything is constantly changing, everything in flux. Furthermore, the act of removing the human from the system is itself a driver of the system. The human can never be removed from the system. So rewilding has more to do with taking inspiration from the past, whatever the baseline, and considering what dynamics might be recaptured for restoring damaged ecosystems and for enriching impoverished habitats with varying degrees of human intervention. And in fact, I came across the most lovely portable definition by Chris Packham, whom some of you might be familiar with. He's an ecologist and a um, broadcaster. And his quote is, rewilding is taking areas of land and trying to bring them back 
into a more natural ecosystem. I like that. Simple enough. And all these descriptions and all these conversations absolutely thrill me. Plenty of juicy conflicts as well in the definitions of the term. Rewilding seems a fantastic idea as far as I'm concerned. But what is the difference between rewilding and wilding? Well, Isabella Tree, I'm sure a number of you have come across Isabella Tree. She's the author of the fantastic book Wilding. Um, came up against this question in the Wilding Project at NEP Estate, um, K-N-E-P-P, NEP Estate in Sussex, and felt that rewilding put more emphasis than they wished on returning apex predators long departed from the British wild. And I quote, the strong association of rewilding with predator reintroductions was already fueling speculation that NEP was about to become some kind of Jurassic Park. I love that. I think it's brilliant. So she and her husband, Charlie Burrell, they opted for wilding rather than rewilding to account for the profoundly entangled role of humans in their project, and also to account for Tamworth pigs rather than boar and longhorn cattle rather than aurochs. Now, I visited NEP um, a year ago in February um, with a group of conservation students um, when the weald and clay was welly sucking and knee deep Cranes were nesting in an old English oak, big grunting pigs snout digging the banks. We crossed a swollen brook and through an old gatepost and gazed across the grass and gorse and thorn at the longhorn cattle pulling at the thickets. And as I stood there gazing, I kind of entered a reverie and I wheeled back in time a couple of decades and I could see what now a wild and sprawling banks aside the gatepost as neatly trimmed hedgerows. I could still just make out the straight lines in the tangle and the wild scrubland as uniform field of crop. I envisaged straight lines of soggy crop and heavy farm machinery now grown out and wilded, hidden as memory beneath wild thickets. What transformation, enrichment, complexification, diversity, wilding, rewilding. There are many definitions of the terms and many commentators have traced the questions about levels of human influence, the size and scope of the vision and the historical model inspired by the restoration, restoration vision. Ultimately, the difference is in the words themselves. Rewilding implies restoring to some state of the past. Wilding implies letting the wild in. But letting the wild in is also the return, restoration, repair, renovation. Looking back is looking forward and looking forward is looking back. And so the border between wilding and rewilding is not at all clear. It's a tangled hedgerow. It's suitably wild. So any exploration of wilding and rewilding cannot get hung up on the definitions of the term. You can't untangle a hedgerow. There's no need. It wouldn't be wild. But what lies at the heart of wilding? Yes, I hear you respond. In order to consider wilding, we must first consider the wild. I'm beguiled by the wild. But what is it? The wild, at least in my imagination, is often the wood. The tussled thickets, the dense understory, the mycelium root interfaces and networks, the wind waving canopy, the wild wood of the wicked weasels and the wind and the willows, the dark forests of fairy tales that Carl Jung's associate Mary Louise von Franz analyzed, and that recently fantastic book Sarah Maitland has explored Gossip from the Forest. What a great book that is. Gossip from the Forest by Sarah Maitland. Now, Rob McFarlane, as you'd probably expect, is a great guide in these word woods, linking the wild and the wood with the root word wald and wield in Anglo-Saxon and the old Teutonic root volsus, voltus, meaning forest. And he writes, this is Rob McFarlane, the world and the wood also graft together in the Latin word silver, which means forest and from which emerged the idea of savage with all its connotations of ferality, end of quote. Well, it's interesting that savage and feral are two of the three ways I translate wild into Spanish. We have the word salvaje and fiero. 
both with connotations of beast-like, both used generally as insults to humans. So if you call someone fiero, you're implying that, that person is from the wild. Whereas feral in English would be more like gone wild, i.e. once was tame. And silvestre, that's an interesting word, silvestre, which is generally used for undomesticated or unfarmed species. And in particular, I think of uh, if you go to a supermarket and buy yogurts, um, frutos silvestres are fruits of the forest, the artificial flavor, but nevertheless, that use of the word silvestre is lovely. But it makes it very hard to translate rewilding or wilding into Spanish. So for wilding, we have asilvestrar, to make more sylvan. We have asilvastramiento, which is the noun. But we also have asalvajar, to make more savage. Asalvajamiento, I got there eventually. But also for rewilding, we have the add the prefix of re. So it's re silvestrar. Resilvastramiento, resalvajar, resalvajamiento. What fantastic words. They don't have quite the purchase that wilding does and rewilding do, does in English. And there are splendid names in Spanish. I love some of these names um, that some of them are used are more used than their cognates in English, such as Silvio and Silvia, Silvino, Silvina, Silvano and the surnames da Silva or da Silva in Portuguese, all of which historically relate to woodland dwellers. And although the word la jungla, the jungle, exists in Spanish, the more common word for jungle is la selva, the wild, the savage, the haunt of the animales salvajes, and perhaps the gente salvaje. But also the word el bosque, which comes from the Latin boscus or buscus, which is cognate with the French bois, and with the English word bush, and it refers to woodland and forest. And I love the fact that to be ambushed is to be embushed, to become surrounded by bush, to be surrounded by woods, to be entangled, emboscado. And I realize that I'm in a constant state of ambushing myself. And I can think of some other connections as well. The Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch, whose, per whose works I adore, in Spanish is known as El Bosco. And that evokes to my mind the grotesque, wild, sylvan quality of his art. I think also of El Buscoso. He's the goat-legged, goat cloven-hoofed, horned, pan-pipe-playing pan -pipe playing fawn of Asturias. And his name evokes the bosky wild lands. He is friend and helper of the small animals and protector of the wild. All these words and all these beasties evoke the wild. So the wild weaves with wood in worlds which once were wooded. Partial woodland cover only. These lands, the British Isles, as the ice retreated were mosaic, grassland, scrubland, treeland, bogland, wetland, dryland, quickland, slowland, never coast to coast woodland. So for people of lands, people from lands of ice or lands of sand or lands of rainforest or lands of ocean, other words in other languages evoke the wild in ice, sand, rainforest and ocean. And I refer now to Jay Griffiths, her fantastic book, Wild, which was, um, if you're looking it up, it's called Savage Grace in its publication in the US, Wild. And she explores these lands of ice and sand and rainforest and ocean. And her story is many stories of how she found the wild present in these places and the people she visited, but more importantly, of how the places and peoples of the land of ice, sand, rainforest and ocean are threatened. So the wild relates to systems in which the tension between human animals and non-human animals is central. So the fault lines of the definition are between that which is natural and that which is human. Human as natural, human as nature, human as that which is not nature, human as that which is not natural. These are complex conundrums. This is entanglement. We cannot point at any ecosystem not influenced by human animals. Even the re most remote part of the earth is influenced by human activity. Even the wildest parts of the natural world 
are affected by us. Even the wildest parts of the natural world are touched by our contemplation of them as the wildest parts of the natural world. The consideration of the separation between humans and not humans enforces the separation between humans and not humans. That's to say, just thinking about it makes it happen. But such an understanding is also tragic. Our crap is part of nature. Petroleum is natural, as, all of our, as, our, as are all its fractional derivatives used for fuel, butane, petrol, jet fuel, kerosene, diesel, as are its derivatives used for pesticides and for fertilizers and for lubricants and for asphalts and plastics. All is, or as is all the other crap with which we poison our landscapes. Gary Snyder has been a great guide for me along this way. Gary Snyder is immortalized as J. V. Ryder, for those of you who know the book, um, in The Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac. Um, Gary Snyder is an absolute wonderful uh, poet and, uh, and, and wild man and a great influence on the Beat Generation. He's integral to the Beat Generation. He published a wonderful book called The Practice of the Wild. And it's a series of really beautiful musings and essays. And he writes, science and some sorts of mysticism rightly propose that everything is natural. By these lights, there is nothing unnatural about New York City or toxic wastes or atomic energy and nothing by definition that we do or experience in life is unnatural." Oh, end of quote. You see, that logic is faultless. If you maintain the distinction, you must define the frontier. If plastic is not natural, then what of sawdust? New York City as natural. It's an image that brings to mind the images of New York that I've absorbed through film and TV since childhood shiny skyscrapers and men in suits in offices with views of shiny skyscrapers, but also the mean wild streets of steam and smoke and shadows and frosty breath and cops and cars and bars. The philosopher Alan Watts, another great guide for me, also considered that fabulous contrast of New York City as part of nature in a letter he wrote to his emerging group of friends soon after he arrived in the US. Strictly speaking, New York City is no more artificial than a bird's nest, for man is just as much an aspect of nature as a bird, and the difference between man and bird is chiefly that man is somewhat more complicated. I love Alan Watts. So I love that idea that our homes are nests. My home is a complicated nest. My children, fledglings. In Roald Dahl's book, The Magic Finger, a nasty family who like to hunt ducks are turned into ducks. First thing they do, build a nest. So the human is nature, but the human is not nature. The human is natural, but the human is not natural. It's a riddle. Human animals and their dazzling array of material inventions and their effluence are all nature. And yet nature is traumatized by human animals and their dazzling array of material inventions and their effluence. Nests are threatened. Our own nests are threatened. It is a wild riddle. But the wild is not only a place. It's not only a state. It's also a process and hence to wild and to rewild. And the wild is also the result of the process be wilded, to be rewilded, a wilded environment, a rewilded ecosystem. So the processes and the pro projects of wilding and rewilding focus the mind on the presence of human induced trauma on the systems that sustain us and that sustain the wild. Wilding evokes the wild, wilding evokes wildness and wilderness, wilderness is always present. I myself inhabit a corner of East Kent, which itself is a corner of England tramped since the Paleolithic by incomers and outgoers, a land crisscrossed by road and rail, town and village, field and farm, a thoroughly de-wilded environment. And yet, and yet 
the wildlands and the wilderness is always present. I seek out and hide away in the rough pockets of wildland and borderlands kept wild precisely by their proximity to road and rail, town and village, field and farm. The neglected scrubland behind the warehouse, the wild margins of the gully, the abandoned plots and lots. I have ducked into thickets, scratched by thorns, following badger trails deep into badger kingdom, overshadowed by the roar of the road and the rattle of the rail. And the wildness that grows from neglect and oblivion, a disused margin between two warehouses and an industrial estate, has become a rich tangle of nettle, elder and buddlier, humming with insects and dancing with butterflies. Suddenly, unannounced, hacked back by council contractors to placate the gods of order and tidiness. A former brickworks, collapsed buildings overgrown with nettle, ed elder and buddlier, humming with insects, dancing with butterflies, fluttering with bats at dusk. Labelled as species poor, neglected and an eyesore on the plans presented by developers to council planning committee who vote in favour of development. Wayside verges bursting with wildflowers and grasses sprayed with glyphosate. Woodlands cleared of the understory, cleared of the dead wood, and their bird-friendly hidey holes removed. Endless bloody lawnmowers, strimmers, hedge clippers, chainsaws shattering the afternoon. Leaf blowers, leaf blowers, leaf blowers buzzing the autumn afternoons. Very costly leaf blowers. Leaves are essential for soil health. They provide mulchy habitats for all manner of small critter. They are dragged under by the earthworms and enrich the nutrient and microbial layers. Birds love hopping through leaves, feasting on the critters, etc. Removing the leaves is removing a major factor of the ecosystem cycle. Leaves are great. Leave the leaves. Let leaf litter. All in order to have tidy lawns. Sod the lawns. End sod the lawns, sod the sod, allow some disorder. Disorder is shunned, wildness is feared, yet the tangled disorder of the wild margins is precisely where life flourishes. The tension between order and disorder is also present within conservation discourse concerning wilding and rewilding. And an example I followed last year very closely and I'll do so this year, that no more may, no mo may, sorry, no mo may hashtag. And in particular, the debate over whether it is an act of wilding or an aspect of control. How much effort is needed to release the effort of mowing? I agree, the concrete and the urban are scrupulously ordered. The wild is disordered, but herein lies the riddle. Another riddle, sorry, I'm full of riddles today. It's not disorder. The wild is not disorder. It's a different kind of order. Back to Gary Snyder. Nature is, dis it, nature is orderly, he says. That which appears to be chaotic in nature is only a more complex kind of order. Yes, bioabundance flows with complexity, not chaos. Alone in the woods, wrote Gerard Manley Hopkins in 1866. I have now found the law of the oak leaves. Isn't that wonderful? The law of the oak leaves. Oak has long been associated with law, oaken law, just law, fair law, durable law, enduring law. Dur is the Celtic word for oak. The law of the jungle is presented as chaos, as savage competition, the strong eating the weak, survival of the fiercest, but that is the law of the human jungle, codified by capitalism, greed for growth, hoarding and surplus. The law of the non-human jungle is not the law of the human jungle, hence we're back in that nature-human dichotomy. The law of the wild jungle is savage harmony, Complex, dense, damp, knotty, thorny, intertwisted, intertwined, interbound, intense, and dynamic harmony. 
The law of the jungle is wild collaboration. This needs to be experienced. Zone out in the woodland, meditate in woodland space-time. The canopy is not an unruly jumble, but the optimization of space and orientation for access to light, it is beautifully ordered. And what's known as crown shyness or canopy shyness or even canopy disengagement or intercrown spacing, I love these terms, it's a graceful and polite, no please, after you as the trees craft their upper branches in delicate deference to each other. Graceful coordination. And beneath the leafy floor, the tree roots interlace with other tree roots through filaments of the mycelial network, buzzing with water, carbon, nitrogen, nutrients, minerals and information, the legendary wood wide web. Mycorrhizal partnerships, mycelial networks, magnificent intelligence, magnificent order, awesome complexity. The woodland is a community, a sharing community. The wild is predicated on mutualistic and commensalistic relationships, collaboration more than competition. Now in discussing or thinking about competition or collaboration, I always tend to argue in favor of collaboration and cooperation as I've just done. But as I reflect deeper, I realize how neither it's neither one nor the other, nor both, nor neither. The law of the jungle is savage competition and wild collaboration inseparably. Predation is competition and collaboration and is integral to the fragile geometry of the ecosystem. Friction and conflict are energy flows in the system. Everything is cooperative and competitive cooperating in competition. But it's not even this. The concepts themselves are inevitably anthropocentric. Neither the trees nor the animals nor the fungi are thinking in these ethical terms. They're just doing their stuff. This is the nature of nature. Wild order, unruly, unkempt, but meticulously choreographed. It is anarchic, not as chaotic or unruly, but as unruled, leaderless. From the Greek anarchia, from an, without, and archos, chief or ruler. Yes, the woodland is profoundly anarchic, and yet it's profoundly inclusive and representative and governed by its own wild will. Now this brings me on to discussion of self-willed. Self-willed is an expression that has a lot of purchase in discussions of wilding and rewilding, a lot of purchase in the projects. Self-willed as self-expression of the system. Step back to grant a biological system of any size a degree of autonomy, sovereignty, self-governance. Complex networks of information and biofeedback circuits spelling self-awareness, consciousness, I'm captivated. This force is present all around us. What Thomas Hardy calls in a wonderful poem, the ancient pulse of germ and birth. Yeah, we all experience that. The will of nature is visible everywhere, thrusting up through the paving, greening the guttering, mossing the roof. Stuff just keeps on growing. The wild is self-willed. But as Jay Griffiths explores, where the wild will is smothered, the wild land becomes wasteland. And I quote from Jay Griffiths, as I went, I found myself increasingly needing to distinguish wildness from wasteland. Wastelands, such as forests raised to the ground, are the inscriptions of tragedy, while wildness erupts with the raw carnival of comedy, laughing its socks off, grace notes galore, honoring the erotic. End of quote. Thank you, Jay Griffiths, that's beautiful. And that's a beautiful, and yet it's a heart-wrenching. Wildness is abundance. Wasteland is the butchering of wildness, the butchering of abundance. Dave Foreman writes of this wonderful term, land scalpers, land scalping, in a way that resembles Jay Griffith's wasteland, land scalping. Sorry, that was Dave Foreman of the, of the, of the Earth First. I mentioned him earlier. Wasteland is pain, 
The wasteland is the kingdom of the sick king who sits wounded and forlorn on his wretched throne, barking sick orders to sick ministers and sick courtesans. There are many sick kings today, misruling sick kingdoms. Wilderness is what wasteland once was and what wasteland one day eventual, eventually will be again. The wild teaches us about the fluidity of consciousness, consciousness that flows into material form, consciousness as projection and reception, my consciousness as part of the ebb and flow of projection and reception. If I scrutinize the boundaries of the woodland, I can find no firm categorical distinction. If I scrutinize the boundaries of a human, of a dog, of a tree, of a stone, of myself, I find no categorical distinction between one and the next. The boundaries are fluid. Yes, there are clear grades of biological function, agency, sovereignty, reflexivity, self-willed autonomy, etc., etc. But ultimately, consciousness flows into material form, whether that material form be flesh and blood, body, tree, river or stone. We are all daimonic beings. All is animate. All is wild. So wilding is not just letting the hedgerows grow. It is recognizing inherent animation in the hedgerows. And I here I cite Jack Hunter. Um, Jack Hunter is a great friend of the of of the um, of myth cosmology and the sacred. Friend of all of us. And he published a fantastic book which I've cited before called Greening the Paranormal. And he writes um, about wilding in a way that goes beyond. Um, some of the ideas from conservation. And he says, by enhancing biodiversity, we are also enhancing psychodiversity. The biodiversity crisis is also a psychodiversity crisis. In this case, rewilding is extremely important. Rewilding and re-enchantment go hand in hand. The process of rewilding of allowing natural systems to regenerate without human interference provides a space for non-human intelligence to flourish, unfurl and reach its full expression." End of quote. Oh, that's a beautiful and straightforward position that no conservationist would quibble with, but Jack takes it further. His profoundly sympathetic exploration of animism positions the study within the wider, fantastic discourse of what he calls anomalistics, the study of the anomalous. Why the anomalous? Why is it important? How does such enrichment help, us, enrichment help us in our time of crisis? Back to Jack. What I'm suggesting, he writes, is that the ontological assumptions underlying the rejection of the so-called paranormal by mainstream materialist science and culture are precisely the same as those that underlie the ecological crisis and our society's fractured relationship with the earth. Yes, I agree entirely. It is easy to destroy something you take to be inert, lifeless, soulless, inanimate. It's straightforward to sit in the cab of a yellow digger and rip apart a hedgerow and woodland knowing it is just stuff harder to rip apart a hedgerow and woodland that you consider as friend. Not impossible, there may be good reason, in the same way that the Lakota honoured buffalo on the buffalo hunt, or the Inuit honoured beluga on the beluga hunt, or Nanook on the polar bear hunt. The question is honour and recognition of personhood. We can slaughter buffalo or honour buffalo. Buffalo is landscape and soulscape. By slaughtering the buffalo of the mind, the mind becomes wasteland, bound to noisy screens of rapidly changing images, sterility through saturation. That is why, that is why the wild calls us out, calls us outside. We cannot separate ourselves from nature, wildness or wilderness. So what is the wild? That is a self-willed question. It is a wild question. You can hack away at the discourse of the wild, but the dense foliage will quickly grow back. Wild definitions sprout wildly, entangling, intertwining, 
spinning stories. And I'm going to leave plenty of time for our discussion, which is what I was intending. And I was intending to finish at about quarter past, and I will do, because I've left myself just enough time to read a poem. And the poem is by a poet that some of you may not be familiar with, because he's not that well known in the English speaking world. His name is Antonio Machado. Um, I'll just quickly pop his name in the chat there. Antonio Machado is one of my absolute heroes. Um, he was a supporter of the, um, su the Republic um, at the time of the Civil War, and he ended up eventually having to leave Spain, and he died just after crossing the border into France. But he left us some tremendous poems, and one of them is called To a Withered Elm. And I'm going to read this to end, which is also my way of returning to the beginning and wishing you all a happy equinox. Okay. To a Withered Elm by Antonio Machado. And this is in translation, obviously. So, so the rhyming and the singing not as it was. But it's a good translation. It's not mine. On the old elm split by lightning and decayed in its centre, with the rains of April and the sun of May, a few green leaves have come out. The age-old elm on the hill, bathed by the duero, a yellowish moss stains the whitish bark of its worm-eaten, dusty trunk. It will not be like the singing poplars that guard the road and the riverbank inhabited by brown nightingales. An army of ants in single file is climbing over it, and in its bowels the spiders spin their grey webs. Before the woodcutter fells you, elm of the Duero, with his axe, and the carpenter converts you into a church bell frame, a wagon pole, or the yoke of a cart, before you burn redly tomorrow in the hearth of some wretched cottage, beside some road, before a whirlwind uproots you, and the gust from the white sierras snaps you, before the river forces you into the sea, by way of valleys and ravines, Elm, I want to set down in my notebook the grace of your newly green boughs. My heart is hoping also, facing the light and facing life for another miracle of the springtime. There you are. Muchas gracias. And there I end exactly at quarter past. <laughs>